Howdy folks! Welcome to 20th Century Adventures. I'm Nathan Logston, and today we're going to do something a little different than what our normal fare is. We're going to make a project. So this is something I've been wanting to do for a little while. Uh, I have a lot of antique tools and I like to work with those tools, I like to explore new skills and historic trades. So I've got a lot of, of material here and maybe this is something that I'll do more of. Uh, depends on how you all react to it. Uh, if you like this content, uh, let me know and maybe we'll do more project videos. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a late 19th, early 20th century hunting horn. And this actually goes back well into at least the 15th century, maybe earlier. Uh, it's a signaling device. So it's basically a trumpet made from a cow's horn. And there's examples all throughout history, uh, even historically, probably prehistory, this sort of thing was used. But it really reaches the apex of its function by the late 19th, early 20th century. So we see a lot of changes over time on this, and then we see this highly functional final version, and then it kind of goes away. They were replaced by tin horns. Uh, some people just opted to not carry anything extra and use three shots as a way of signaling uh, to their other hunting party. Uh, but that's not as great in, in modern times when uh, we're worried more about safety and uh, we're also worried about the price of ammunition. So I feel like this is a good time to go back to the idea of the hunting horn. So the concept is this really is only necessary when you're hunting with other people. So, you know, we've talked about hunting camps and and group hunts and things like that. And it's a lot of fun to get out with your friends and do a hunt. Uh, so let's say that you're uh, hunting deer, for example, and you're in a large woods and you know that your buddy is about a half mile off to the west and another buddy is a half mile to the east and you're heading south and you shoot a deer. Well, you haven't heard any other shots and you've got a big deer that you can't get out of this spot by yourself. So that's a good time to blow on the horn. And it's a sound that will travel, uh, it carries well, it's distinct, it can't be mistaken for anything else. And so it's something that uh, becomes very useful and you can signal, you know, you prearrange with your friends, you say, um, you know, one blast on the horn, means that I've shot something and I need help carrying it out. Uh, or uh, you might say two blasts means I'm lost and I need you to blow a blast on your horn so that I can figure out your directions. Uh, or traditionally, uh, and this has been the case for centuries, three blasts on the horn uh, or three shots fired in succession is an emergency call. And so that is the call that I am in trouble and I need assistance immediately. Uh, so it's a good thing to have. And, and it was even during the, the 20th century on up into modern times, uh, people to the, today still continue to carry whistles and things like that. Although the cell phone has kind of changed the need for such signaling. Uh, with the cell phone, you can call your buddy and say, hey, uh, you know, here's the situation. Uh, but in the time before there were cell phones, uh, this was this was necessary. So hunting horn, uh, a tin horn, or a whistle uh, were all common used things in this period. So we're going to make a hunting horn. Now, what I'm going to start with is this polished cow horn. You can buy these online. Uh, there's lots of different places you can find these. Um, you can find them in different grades and conditions. I would get one that's already been thinned out. If you get a raw horn, uh, just as it comes off the cow, it's gonna be super thick. There's a lot of material to get through there. You will spend hours scraping on that thing. And so I just, I like to start with something smaller, uh, no matter what I'm doing with horn. Uh, I like to start with something that's already been scraped thin and already polished. Um, now this high polish on, on this one, this is not a great horn. Uh, I should have grabbed a better one, but um, 
this one's got some delamination issues going on with it, and it's got a couple of gouges where somebody wasn't taking a lot of care when they when they made this. Um, but it'll it'll suffice for our purposes. We're gonna make a real plain Jane simple hunting horn. You could make these as fancy as you wanted or as simple as you wanted. Some of them uh, had the mouthpiece carved in. You'd want to use probably a raw horn if you were gonna do that because you would need extra thickness up here at the end to make the, the mouthpiece shape. Um, but what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna do a, uh, a coronet mouthpiece, which is a type of trumpet, uh, and fitting that inside of the cow horn so that this becomes your mouthpiece. And you would blow on it the same way you do a trumpet. So you, you put your lips together, any of you that have never played trumpet before, uh, this is how it's done. You put your lips together, and you push air out through them tightly. So it's, it's not, it's not blowing. It's, it's, you're making that vibration with your lips. So when you put your lips against the piece, now that's going to be highly amplified by our horn because by itself, it wouldn't be loud enough. So, uh, these can be decorated in all sorts of different ways. Um, and uh, we'll probably do a little bit of, of scrimshaw work on this one. Uh, so what we're gonna do to start with is we're gonna take some fine sandpaper because this has already been polished out. I don't really want to uh, get into uh, having to re-polish it, but it's too slick. Uh, so it'll be hard to work with because the surface has been polished so much that it's just, it's just way slick and our, our scrimshaw tools will glance off of it and you'll get a lot of errors that way. Um, so we're going to take some, this is 600 grit, and all we're doing is we're just taking the shine out of it. So we're going back, and you can see it's kind of getting this dusty look to it. And this just gives us a less rough surface, or less smooth surface, rather. Makes it easier for scrimshaw and other work. All right, so that's about all we need. Like I said, just enough to make it not quite so smooth. So you want basically a dull matte finish all the way over on the horn. So our next step is we will need to cut off the tip so that we can shape for our mouthpiece. Because um, this is this comes to a point, we don't want that. So we're gonna want to take off let's say about three quarters of an inch off the end of it. That's gonna give us, let's go an inch. If we go an inch, it gives us plenty of meat to work with there. We'll still have a good solid band of horn uh, once we've drilled out for the mouthpiece to go in. All right. All right, that looks pretty good. That's gonna give us quite a bit to work with there. So now we'll just take a rasp. Set this over here, we won't need it for a while. Take this rasp here and we'll just start working our edge here a little bit make it more round. Now all I'm doing is I'm deburring that outer edge. I'm just making the outer edge a little bit rounded. I don't want to actually take anything off the surface here. Uh, because if it's too smooth, it'll be hard to start to drill. All 
All right. So I'm going to just mark where I want that hole to start, which will be right in the middle. I don't know if you can see this or not, but I'm going for the very dead center of where I cut it. And you can kind of see there's a little bit of a dark spot there, and that's where the natural center of the horn is going to be too. So we definitely want to try to hit that because that's less drilling we have to do and we're less likely to go out the side of the horn too. So I've made a start and I'm going to take this outside to drill on it because my wife doesn't like the smell of the horn in the house. Uh, so we're going to do that part outside. Um, I want to make it no bigger than the very end of this because the trumpet mouthpiece is tapered and so it's wider at this end, skinnier at this end. So if I start out making it the size of this, then I know that that'll go all the way through and then I won't have as much work to do with the file to taper the inside of this to make the mouthpiece fit because you definitely want to taper it to match. Uh, so, so that's what we're going to do next. Okay, so I got that drilled. Definitely guys do this outside. Drilling on horn, using any sort of, uh, anything other than the, the little bit of sanding I did here uh, is going to make horn smell really, really bad. Uh, when you use something like a drill bit, or uh, if you do any real heavy sanding or scraping, uh, it's gonna smell pretty rough. So do that outside. Ended up that a 3 8 drill bit was perfect for this. Um, it went a little deeper than I wanted, um, but the 5 16 wasn't even gonna be close. So uh, we went with 3 8 which puts us about halfway. It gives us still plenty of room to get that good and tight. Uh, so what we're gonna do next, is we're going to take our um, needle files, not that one, there I've got a round file here this will probably be ideal. And make sure when you are drilling this that you do drill all the way through to the inside. You should be able to blow through it. Um, if you don't get all the way to the inside, you're defeating the whole purpose. So we're going to work on just our, our upper end here. You're not really trying to do too much further down. And pay attention. You know, inevitably you're going to be a little off center somewhere. So if you look at where I drilled this, my hole is, is a little thinner, or my horn is thinner here than it is over here. Uh, so in the process of doing this, pay attention to make sure you're not getting too thin here because you're going to want to round that hole the same way all the way around. Uh, we can fix this as we shape on the outside. Uh, but what we want to make sure of is that we're not getting this wall too thin. So that's where it'll crack. And keep rotating around so that you're getting an even filing all the way around on it. Don't use power tools on these because it's just not going to go well. You'll take off too much material way too fast. Test fit frequently. See, we're already deeper than we were on that mouthpiece. And it's sticking better. That's what we want. It doesn't really take that much. So if you get too crazy with it or you use a power tool, you're just going to mess up your project real fast. That's pretty good. I think that's going to do the trick. 
So now we can kind of get an idea of how this is going to sound. Okay, so I'm not real good at this. <laughs> it sounds a little bit like a sick cow, but you know what? It's, it's going to get the job done. It's going to get the sound out across the countryside. Uh, this will carry up the hollers in the hills. So point is, is that it's working the way it's supposed to. All right, so now we're going to think about how we want to decorate this and, and what kind of shapes we want to put into it and things like that. So this is where we'll start to, and if, if you can draw it, you can carve it. Uh, so I like to kind of think about a sideways glance at it. You know, if I'm looking straight at it this way, what would it look like in profile? And again, we're not going to want to get into our uh, hole that we drilled. All right, so I've kind of drawn a little oval on there because that's what I want the shape of the horn to have. And so now we can go back to our rasp. We're done with this for now. <clears throat> and you can really sort of go hog wild at first because you're taking a lot of material out. So we want this to taper inward. I'm going to start there and I'm going to go all the way around with my rasp. Okay, now I'm going to go down to where I want to make my next design, and I'm going to use my scratch all here so that I can get my, I'm going to draw it first, I'm going to get my band as straight as possible here, at least to where it looks decent. If any of you guys are into muzzle loading, this is essentially the same thing as making a powder horn. The only difference is we're not going to plug the end. A lot of the principles are the same. So what I would like to try to do here is I want to create some flats because of the way I want to decorate this. So, what we're going to go for is probably one down the center. Okay, that's pretty close. It's going to give us a decent look. We'll just scratch this in here because the, um, the pencil will wear off as you are working this. And if you scratch it in, then you'll still have all your lines while you're working. All right, so now we've got all of our lines scribed into there, so they'll stay put. And then all that's left is to start making the flats. So do them one at a time, try to stay between your lines.
All right, and there's our first flat. So it's got a nice edge on both sides of it. And now we just gotta do that 10 more times around the outside. Sorry folks, I noticed that my uh, cameras had quit working. Uh, I guess uh, they didn't want to film as long as I was going to work. So uh, all you missed was more of the same. I've been working these flats down. What I like to do when I change, um, you know, I start with something coarse to work the shape out um, and then go to something lighter and then something finer as I go. So uh, I just finished doing everything that I wanted to do with this file on the, the flats and they're looking pretty good. I did have one spot here where the, the horn was very thin and I ended up going through the horn there. That's regrettable. Uh, if it was a powder horn, it would be runned uh, because with powder, you can't have any areas for the powder to leak out or for water to get in. Uh, with this being a hunting horn, I'm not so worried about that. I could actually just leave it. Uh, I may put a patch over it. We'll see. I haven't quite decided how I'm gonna deal with that. Uh, it may just, I may just end up putting the strap over that spot. Um, but anyway, whatever I do, it's not going to matter because we're not storing anything that has to stay dry inside this. Uh, we're just using it as, a, as an instrument. So there's a few places where I kind of went a little too deep with the coarser tools. Um, I could work on taking that out, but I'm afraid I'm going to go through the horn again because it's rather thin. So I may just leave those for character marks. Uh, it's already got some from its its beginning anyway. So um, so anyway, that's where we're at. Um, we've got our hole drilled. We've got it tapered. Uh, we've done some shaping on this end here. Uh, that's about all the decoration this end's going to get. And then we'll switch to doing some decoration on, on this end. Now, a lot of the cheaper horns, you know, homemade horns, stuff that was um, maybe not an upper class hunter, but you know, just somebody out um, walking the wilderness. A lot of them just had some scalloping or design or something on the outer edge of the horn. Uh, but a lot of your fancier ones, the German ones, the ones that were for uh, high class uh, stag hunting, uh, those would have a silver, almost like a trumpet bell on the end of them. Uh, and so to do that, you would have to, like you do with a powder horn, you would have to boil this horn and shove a plug in there. You have to scrape it so you can get something in there. This one's got some burrs. Um, but we would boil the horn to soften it uh, and then hammer a plug in there to make it round and then remove that plug. Uh, and then I would use the bell off of maybe a damaged trumpet or something like that. Uh, to put onto the end of it to give it that look. But I'm not going to do that. Uh, like I said, we're making a simple uh, woodsman's horn, uh, so I'm not really going all out on decoration. Uh, this is this is more something that uh, the ordinary huntsman, uh, woodsman, forester might have made for himself in the late 19th century or early 20th century. So uh, these pretty much had lost favor by the 1910s, uh, the, the whistles and, and uh, metal tin horns becoming much more popular uh, because nobody wanted to take the time to make these things. Uh, we, by that point, we had already developed our fast-paced uh, commercialized society, and so we weren't as interested in doing this kind of work. I mean, this, this, this alone has taken me hours. Um, so there's a lot of effort that goes into it, um, and, and people were moving towards uh, mass production and instant gratification, um, which is where we are today. <laughs> so it's nice to slow down and do something the old-fashioned way for a change um, and make something pretty with your hands. So, all right, on to the next step. Anyway, I can work on that. I'm not going to bore you with endless hours of me sanding. 
uh, let's look at our end and how we want to make that look nice. Now you can use a, um, a compass, um, a drawing compass, not a directional compass, uh, to make geometric shapes. That was really popular in this period uh, throughout the entirety of the 19th century, actually. Uh, that came into popularity around the 1820s or so uh, on powder horns. You see it a lot, uh, geometric shapes drawn with a compass. Um, and then uh, as time progresses, um, that carries over into these kind of horns as well. So uh, you can certainly use a compass to make your designs. Uh, I think I'm going to freehand it here. Um, I don't know. Actually, you know what? I think I'm just going to shape it and let it be how it wants to be. So uh, this is where the creative artist comes out. Uh, kids, don't try this at home. So we'll go right about there. Side where I got a little burr. Yeah. So I just made a little divot with the file. And I'm going to do the same thing. See if I can do that maybe all the way around here. And the trick is going to be keeping them more or less even. All right, that worked out pretty well. So all I did was I just took that round file all the way around to kind of give it this little crenellation and I think it turned out pretty nice. I've seen this done on some other original horns and I kind of like the look so I think that's, uh, that's all that's gonna get as far as the end. All right, so now we're down to basically uh, sanding everything down and then the next step is going to be to do the dyeing and the scrimshaw and make our brackets for how we're going to hang it from from the shoulder so uh, that's that's the next step so I'm going to sand on this for a while and and uh, edit that out so that you guys don't have to watch it all right so now we're ready to start on uh, the final finishing here, I've uh, sanded all this down for where it's pretty smooth. I'm fairly happy with it. Uh, there's still a few imperfections, but that's just going to give it character. So uh, the next step here is uh, to get started on our scrimshaw. So what I've done, you may have seen earlier, I had a piece of paper. Um, I cut out, or I printed off some images that I liked for my design and uh, I made them in several different sizes because I wasn't sure which size I was going to want and uh, obviously the smallest size would fit 
fairly well, especially if I was going to do, uh, say, the, the whole design. I'm not sure that I want to do the whole design. Um, I haven't really made up my mind here, but I need to make a decision fast. So I might, um, I might do all of this, or I might use the bigger design and just do the deer and the, the horse. Uh, so this is a scene uh, representative of um, uh, St. Hubert. He's the patron saint of hunters uh, in, in the Catholic faith. Um, I figured I would put him on here uh, because, uh, you know, I like to invoke whatever help I possibly can when it comes to hunting. Um, now with, with this one, obviously this one's way too big. It's just, it's going to cover way too much area and you won't be able to see the design. Um, with this one, we've got a lot of curvature in the horn, uh, so that may not, it may be hard to transfer this. So I'm thinking we'll go with the little one, and, uh, and we'll see how we do on, uh, on the whole design there. All right, so the first thing you want to do is you're going to take this piece of paper, and we're gonna blacken the back side of it. Um, so I'm gonna use a 6B charcoal pencil because it's very soft. Uh, it'll put a lot of nice black on the, uh, on the back side of this. And then we'll use that to transfer. We'll go back over the design with a pencil. Um, so it's kind of hard to see once I lay it down. Let's see if that makes it better. Yep, that's a little bit better. All right, so you can kind of faintly see where the design is and sometimes it helps just to lift it up a little bit make sure you're in the right place and then we're just gonna go over this with the charcoal pencil you could also use carbon paper it's a little harder to find these days because people don't use it except for artwork um, and uh, it can be kind of expensive for that reason and so uh, you won't use very much of it. And so this really, if you have a, a 6B charcoal pencil, this will give you plenty of carbon to transfer with. I think we got that. Okay. So the next step is we're going to put this in the location that we want the design. And then we're going to tape that into place. I'm using a little bit of masking tape here. Probably not the period solution. Um, if you wanted to stay entirely historically correct on this, of course, you wouldn't have printed out your transfer on a computer. Um, but uh, you could also use gum Arabic. Uh, or uh, even a little bit of horse side glue to stick that down, keep it from moving. Uh, but just for convenience sake, we're gonna cheat and use this masking tape. We're gonna make sure we don't cover our design in the process. All right, now, Now this is a 2HB uh, graphite pencil because we don't really need to put down much color here. Um, fairly sharp so that it kind of, uh, so you can do the finer details. And something else you can do here is you can take your awl that you're going to scratch with and you can kind of make little dots in the most important areas um, that will hold up better, won't accidentally wipe off like the, the charcoal will. Um, but I'm gonna start just going in with my design here. And uh, I'm probably gonna simplify this a little bit as I go because it is so detailed. 
Um, so it's not going to come out quite as detailed in the final product. And we're not worried about shading right now. We can do that on the fly. Right now it's important just to get the design in there. And this is so small and delicate in the design that I'm afraid uh, we're going to lose a lot of detail. But it'll still be noticeable as to what it is. All right, I got the outline of my deer. I'm not going to really do much in the way of um, details on the face or anything like that. Uh, we're going to put the hillside in here just because that will prevent us from having something that looks like a deer floating in the air. And I don't like the way that the, the hill is shaped if you look at this image. The hill is kind of shaped like a wave. Hills don't quite do that. Uh, so I'm going to round it a little more and drop it down. It'll look more like a rock. It's your project. You can do it however you want to. And you can use any design you want. You don't have to use this design. Um, whatever suits your fancy. All right, now we got this horse to do. It's most important to get all the contours of the body shapes, get that outline in there. All the fine details you can do without having to transfer it. All right, and he's holding something up, waving it. Um, I'm not sure what that is supposed to represent because here's his bow here. Um, so I'm going to leave that out just because it's going to add more fine details that are going to be confusing. So he'll just have his hand up. Um, I think that'll end up looking a lot better. And just for convenience sake and ease, I'm going to do away with the, the dogs and the tree branch. Uh, so all of this I won't do uh, and I won't put the dogs in there. I'm just going to have the rider, the horse, and the, and the stag. Uh, so I've covered all of that. Um, I'm going to mark where my shadows go underneath the horse. And then that's going to be it. And we'll see how well this transferred. Hopefully it did what it was supposed to do. Oh yeah. All right, Let's set that aside. And there we go, there's our design. Uh, I think that's good enough to start with. It'll give us something to go on. Should come out pretty decent. Now you gotta be careful because this charcoal will wipe off real easy. <clears throat> so I'm going to use my larger version of this as my guide. That way I can work the details in after I do the outline. It's important to do the outline first because otherwise you'll uh, end up wiping off your your charcoal outline. And for this, it actually, it really helps if um, 
your scribe is, is very sharp. So I'm gonna sharpen this just a little bit. And a lot of guys like to use a, um, like an X-Acto knife or something like that. Uh, I'm more of a purist, so I'm gonna use this 150 year old scribe or all. And it's just, you're not using much pressure. You're basically drawing, but you pull your tool. You never push it. And you'll notice I started on this end I'll work my way this way. That way, if I start over here, I'd be wiping my hand across it. And you don't want to do that. It also helps to rest your elbow on the table. You want to use your wrist for all this. Uh, all your control is in the fingers and the wrist. Don't move your elbow, don't move your arm, all right? And for shading, wherever you need to shade something, you just make a lot of finer lines. Basically you're making grooves that are going to hold the ink. So keep in mind also when you're shading to make your lines make sense. So if you're doing fur, small downstrokes, um, same way with feathers and things like that. You don't want to uh, go across. It's going to look weird. And if you do mess up, you can always sand that back out and repolish. And having good light is a must. Make sure your lighting is adequate. So there's about five arrows in the quiver, but for the sake of making our image look good, I'm going to reduce that to three. It'll just kind of give it more definition. If we put too many arrows in there, uh, it'd be hard to see. A lot of it's more about giving the impression, letting the eye fill in some of the details. Of course, some people who do scrimshaw get it very, very fine and detailed. I'm just not that good. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm simplifying the image um, as I work so that it still looks decent, uh, even though maybe I'm not the ideal artist for this. Anybody can do this. You just got to have a lot of patience and uh, a stout hand. Don't forget to give your hand some breaks now and then. Remember, if things aren't clear or you're just not sure about your details, go back and look at your original image so that you can figure it out. Here we kind of lost the horse's ears. And so I'm going to have to make those from scratch, pun intended. So our saddle blanket here, uh, underneath of where our, our rider is, uh, is black. And his boots are black. And his frock is black. So what we're going to want to do is lighten some of that up. Uh, what I'm going to end up doing here is I'm going to leave the clothing white and the boots white and I'm going to just do the saddle blanket because that'll kind of give some definition to everything.
And for that, I am going to do a diagonal line. Uh, you could also do cross hatches. Uh, maybe I'll do that. We'll see. Uh, just depends on how things go here. And all we have left is our stag. All right, there's our design. So the next step is we're gonna wanna put a little ink on that. And I always like to use real India ink. Uh, use the right stuff. It works way better. Now I've also, if you notice, I changed up the table a little bit. Underneath of my protective craft paper, I've also put a folded up cardboard box. Uh, that's just in case we end up spilling something. Uh, we don't want to have that soak through to the table. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this Q-tip. We're going to get a little ink on the Q-tip. And we're just going to start working that into the design. I like to use a circular motion to help get that ink way down into all of our little cuts. All right, now you can use a rag. I'm using a paper towel. I'm gonna wipe that off. And it's gonna leave some staining where that ink has already started to dry. You can actually go back over it and then wipe. And that takes some of it out because it rehydrates the ink that has dried. But we'll go back and polish with steel wool and it'll look a lot better. All right, so we've got a pretty good coating of ink down in there now. Let's polish that out and see what that looks like. We can probably use our uh, 600 grit sandpaper here as long as we don't go too deep. Don't rub hard. You're just going to very lightly go over the surface with it. So our design's coming out there, and it's pretty clear already that I didn't go deep enough, because our lines are pretty faint. But we've got a pretty good start here. All right, I think I'm gonna go back over that, try to get a little more definition into those lines. The, the deer looks good. We just need a little bit more towards the bottom of this horse. Most of the time, scrimshaw is amateur work. So it doesn't matter how good or how bad you are. It's still going to be correct. All right. I'm pretty happy with that.
that's what we're going to end up with. And it may come out in a little more definition uh, after we do our stain on the uh, on the horn here on the outside of it. All right. So next step that we want to do here is I want to give it a little bit of pizzazz, and we're going to dye this trimmed portion of the horn. And we're going to do it with some green leather dye. And this stuff will stain like nobody's business. So be extra careful and make sure that you're not wearing something you care about. This probably would go on a lot faster and darker if I was using an actual applicator sponge for doing leather dyeing. Um, however, I wouldn't have as much control, especially along the edge here where I don't want to get any dye. So for that reason, I'm using the Q-tip. All right, that's probably about all we're going to get, because if you look, um, you know, the areas that I've been going over are glossy. That means it's not really soaking up much of the dye anymore. Uh, some of these areas where it's a little dull now, I might be able to get a little bit more into. But basically, we're about to the limit of how much dye the surface of the horn is going to hold. And it's not going to come out that green. When we wipe it off, some of that's going to come off. All right, so that's that. That's all we're going to do with the green. So now we'll just let that kind of sit for a little bit. Let that dye have some time to work in there. And uh, take a little break, come back to it in a second. Okay, I think our green is thoroughly dry. It's as dry as it's going to get. A little bit coming off there. So we'll just kind of give it a good wipe. All right. Now, we want to do something with the body of the horn. And I'm just going to use a little bit of this dark tan leather dye. We'll kind of go over it with that. It'll give it kind of an aged appearance. Bring a little more color to it. And see how that really makes the scrimshaw pop too. For the sake of making everything smooth and not having too much variation in our color, I'll go ahead and wipe that. It's going to soak in pretty quick anyway. <clears throat> we don't want to go too dark, so we're not going to do multiple coats like we did with the green. So that's what we're going to end up with. And uh, the next step is we're going to make the attachments so that it can be hung uh, while wearing. And uh, But I'm going to let this Go ahead and dry for a minute, make sure all that gets where it needs to be. In the meantime, we've got a little piece of gold chain here, or brass chain really, and some wire. And what we're going to do is we're going to make 
um, a keeper so that we don't lose our mouthpiece in the woods. So I've got a piece of wire, I'm going to fold it in half, and then I'm going to take my pliers here, grab a hold of that, right where I made that loop. I doubled it over, made a little loop in the bottom. Now I'm going to crisscross those wires, and then I'm just going to pull and twist. I'm going to keep these almost at right angles to each other, or to the, to the main twist. If you did this with a vise and a power drill, it would come out a lot finer. You could also do it with a hand drill and a vise, but I'm just doing this by hand, so it's not going to come out perfect. What we're looking for is enough length to go around this, and I think we've got it. So what we're going to do now is we'll thread these tails through our loop. Oh, we got to put our chain on first, though. Slide the tails through the chain. Slide the tails through the loop. Can't see what I'm doing. All right. Now that's going to go on here. Keep the chain at the bottom so that it hangs nicely. Go on down past our twist here. And then just feed that around the loop again. This is where the pliers come in handy. You can pull that out. We've got the end of our twist and the end of our tails sticking up here. What we'll do is crimp those a bit and then twist all that together. All right. I forgot to grab some wire cutters, so I'll have to get some wire cutters and cut off the tails there. But now we've got that, <clears throat> we're going to do the same thing again, but this time we're going to attach it to the mouthpiece. Alright, again, I'll get some wire cutters and cut that off. But now, when we fit our mouthpiece in there, our chain will prevent that from getting lost if it gets hung on brush. All right, now we've got a pretty horn. All right, the next step that we need to do is we're gonna need to make a way to hang this. And so we're gonna use a piece of this copper here we're going to cut out a strip 
that will go. Yep, that'll be long enough. So we'll just use this whole edge right here. We're going to cut out a strip about this wide. So that's probably three quarters of an inch, maybe a little bit more. off flush square all right and then we're going to clip the corners of these nice little price tag looking shape on the end there. And then we need the hand vise. So this little tool, what we'll do is we'll clamp small section in here. Tighten it down so it doesn't move. Make sure that it's as square as possible in there. You want this line square to that. Make sure that your edges are going to look real nice in there. And then all we're going to do is we're going to bend that flat, just like that. And if you want to really make sure it's good, tap it a little bit with something soft. That'll give it a nice crisp edge. Like that. And we're going to do the same thing on the other side. All right, so now we have our brackets. We'll have to drill a hole in each end of this and then make some small holes and we'll attach that on top like this. And then we'll probably want to put a little shape in this. We may need to clip these corners to do it. All right. So the next thing we're going to do, drill some holes in the ends for our lanyard, and then we're going to drill some holes down the center here that we can put little screws into to go in. Now we're going to be real careful because we know we're kind of thin right here. And so I'm going to want to not do too much with the screws in there. I'll probably put one, maybe two in there, uh, and we'll have to make sure they fall right in the center where it's a little thicker. Um, but. Uh, the rest of this is going to be thick enough for the screws. I'm not worried about it. All right, got to go find some wire cutters. Okay, so I got this drilled. Uh, unfortunately, the drill bit caught it in the, the drill press and uh, kind of mangled it, so I had to reshape it. 
Uh, I think it looks okay now. Uh, it was pretty badly mangled before. Now one thing I want to do real quick before I do this is I'm going to put just a little conditioner. This is actually leather conditioner, but most things that work for leather will also work for horn. So we're going to put a little bit of this on kind of as a way of sealing the horn <clears throat> and giving it a little bit of uh, condition, a little bit of polish. So I'm just going to kind of work that in. Now you might notice we lost a little bit of the green doing that. That's to be expected because these dyes don't hold real well to the, the horn. It's not as porous as leather. Um, that's why you generally want to try to use a darker dye. Uh, so if you, like for this, we used a dark tan for this, and uh, you know, that would have been a lot darker. It would have been almost a brown color on leather. All right. Now, we need little tiny brass screws and a little tiny screwdriver. Okay, I think this is going to do the trick. I uh, just had to break down and use some modern tools, I'm afraid. So, drilled a little pilot hole, tested it. Sorry, one of my lights has already died on me again. Uh, so that's uh, obviously I need some non battery powered lights for long things like this. Hey, that worked out real nice. Cool. All right. I'm going to apologize for the use of a modern tool here, um, but I don't have anything historically accurate that is small enough to do this kind of work. So we've got to break down and use the, the good old Milwaukee. Okay, there we go. Now, go ahead and curl this edge just a little bit here. I think I'm pretty happy with that. All right, all that's left is to put a leather wang on there to hold that and we're ready to go hunting. Let's see how it sounds, shall we? I have a feeling you could probably call an elk with that <laughs> or maybe a sick cow. <laughs> anyway, it's definitely a distinct and very loud noise. Well, I think this is going to make a fantastic addition to my 1890s hunting outfit. I'm very excited about this. I'm glad you all got to be a part of, of seeing this come to life. Uh, if this is something you'd like to see more of, me doing project videos showing how to make things, let me know in the comments uh, so I know whether or not to keep on doing these sorts of videos. Thank you all for watching. I really appreciate it. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll see you down the road.